Hi, this is Joseph Anthony of TappingWithMusic.com. Thank you so much for stopping by. This is going to be just a little mini thing on thing on teaching second grade in the Waldorf schools. These are my ideas. These are not endorsed by the school I teach in, the uh, Waldorf School of Philadelphia, nor Oz, nor anything. These are Waldorf-inspired ideas that uh, I have used in my experience, and I just want to share them with you. So take them for what you will. Hopefully you find them helpful. Um, this will probably end up being a two-part thing where I'll talk a little bit about second grade and my ideas about it, and in the second one I'll give you some ideas for songs and poems and stuff that I've used. Uh, but for now, second grade, the way I see second grade in the Waldorf-inspired classroom is a continuation of first grade. And in first grade, my goals for my students uh, when I taught first grade were to make them feel comfortable, to make them love being in the classroom, to help them love themselves and each other and me. Really, to be comfortable. That was the overarching goal for first grade, and that continues to be the overarching goal in second. Um, you might automatically be thinking, oh my gosh, no, the goals are, you know, place value, lowercase letters, vowels, nah, nah, nah. and all those, to me, are secondary to what I feel like I'm doing in the second grade. If we think about Steiner's idea that at, at, at around the age, age seven and the change of teeth, the life forces, the etheric, whatever you want to call it, is being born being born so it can help form character, habits, good inclinations, the memory. And so we're dealing with a force that is young. It's around one year old when we get it in first and second grade. It's a very young force. And we're really not meant to tax it with over-intellectualized stuff in first and second grade. For me, first and second grade are laying the foundations for future learning. So if, if some of the keys um, to first and second grade are reverence, veneration, this sense of discipleship, this sense of authority, the love that a teacher feels for their students and the love the students feel for their teacher, that is the groundwork for the later years. And if I can help these children feel comfortable and love learning and feel that they will do anything for me, then I've succeeded teaching first and second grade. Um, because they're going to get to a place where they're going to have to do stuff they may not want to do. So, developing that will through my authority, your authority as teacher, um, is really key. And so, I don't want to harp on that too much, but that is a huge thing to me. It's having these children love being in school. Education, Steiner said, at this age should be based on joy and happiness. So, all that said, Second grade, we have this wonderful opportunity to present them with legends, traditionally known as saint legends. I call them wisdom figures. To me, the world is too big to call them saint legends anymore. Um, I don't just do Christian wisdom figures in my class. Um, if the goal was to get them to develop, if it's to help them develop character and good inclinations and a conscience through this growing life force, to give them these wonderful pictures to emulate, um, the world's just too big to give them just from one particular tradition. 
Now, we're not talking religion, we're not talking proselytizing and dogma and trying to convert. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about giving people, giving living images and examples of people who have transformed themselves through uh, heavenly powers, you could say, through the power of the divine, through their own hard work, to overcome things in themselves, to eventually come to a place of service of themselves and humanity, to give them these wonderful legends. And so I give them glimpses of these people, the Baal Shem Tov from the Hebrew tradition, uh, several Christian mystics, of course, St. Francis, that kind of thing. But I don't shy away from modern people either. I gave them a glimpse of Mother, Tre Mother Teresa, <laughs> gave them a glimpse of Martin Luther King Jr., um, gave them a glimpse of, of people, um, Josefina Bakita, um, modern African saint wisdom figure, and uh, give them flavors of that, and not too crazy on the images, I know that sounds sort of heretical, but if we give a first and second grade child too many images, then we're sort of saturating that feeling life, and they just get dreamy, and they don't know what's going on. So give them a picture. Steiner, I think it's in Education with the Child, says, give them these rich images so they can divine within themselves what they're supposed to learn. I don't preach. I don't give them the lesson or the moral. I give them the image and the opportunity for them to take it in so they can learn what they need to learn. I trust them that these beings who've come down and are before me, I trust their inclinations, I trust their wisdom, that they will form the images within themselves that they want and need. So, my goal, help them be comfortable and use stories like the saint legends, wisdom figures, um, people like that from around the world, modern and ancient. And some people like to say in second grade you're putting this juxtaposition between the foibles of the fables and the wisdom figures. And I personally don't like that idea. Because um, I find a lot of wonderful wisdom in the fables. These animal things. I just, I don't put it in my mind like that. Animal wisdom figure. I just don't. Because uh, you look at the, the crow in the pitcher. Uh, the fable of the crow in the pitcher. The, the crow's thirsty. And there's a little bit of water in that pitcher. And, and the crow doesn't give up. It, it thinks this through. And starts putting pebbles in the in the pitcher and the water rises and then the crow can get that water. That is a wonderful image of wisdom. Many of the fables are like that. Of course there's the fox and the grapes. Of course there's those kinds of things where the monkey puts his hand in the jar and can't get it up. Unless he lets go of the treat. Those are important too. Those little images. Giving little pictures of nature things that I've seen on my way to school, little images that they can live with. So, my first class, and maybe even a little bit in my second, second grade, I did a, a wisdom figure block for language arts and math, and then a, a fables block. Uh, this time around, my third time teaching second grade, I wove them together. So in one block, I may give a fable, and I may give a wisdom figure. Um, in the same week. And um, I want their quote unquote animal natures not to be conquered, but transformed and used in a way that can help in their formative forces to develop good habits. I mean, the ultimate goal, I want them to have egos down the road that are strong enough through their habits and inclinations that they formed to make wise decisions in their thoughts and in their feelings, right? So, fables, and I didn't just give Aesop either, uh, in the same way I didn't give just Christian legends. I gave fables from around the world, Buddhist fables, 
the Anansi stories, the wonderful Anansi stories of the, of the spider. Great stories. Um, and I'm thinking that this video may end up being a, th <laughs> a three-part series because, gosh, Waldorf teachers like to yak. So I'm going to stop in a minute um, and, and let you digest what I've said so far. But to sum it up before we move on, goals for second grade, help them be comfortable and love being there. Love each other and love you. Using stories and images, not too much. I know that sounds crazy, but not too many images. But enough to awaken their own powers of forming their own mental pictures. Let them form the pictures. I give them an example. I do a drawing. Great. Give them, give, guide them through that. That's wonderful. But let them form the pictures within themselves. That's what's going to last. So, um, still laying the groundwork for the future in second grade, in my opinion. And uh, how about before we stop, I'll give just a little bit of, um, uh, I want to say just a few words about what I just said about having them draw, for example, in their morning lesson book, an image that you've given. Um, I, of course, guide drawing still in second grade, but not always. Not always. I want to give them good techniques, how to shade, blend, form, compose a picture. But too much, I think, is relied upon in the recall of a story, in the, the, the oral and the drawing. So I'll have them orally recall it, which is good, and then, oh, okay, draw a picture. I think it's, I think it's, I've become a little bit of a crutch my opinion. Don't forget about beeswax. Don't forget about drama as ways of, for them to do something with what you've given. Um, and also, another thing, I think, I, at least I used to be really worried about the way my morning lesson books for my students looked. They had to be perfect because, you know, they were used as marketing tools at open houses and things like that and parents and I wanted them to look a certain way and now I've really changed my attitude about morning lesson books to me they're works in progress it's the children's way of forming an image in with their senses right with their eyes and their hands and in a drawing and in, in writing in written form of something that I've given them they've processed it and there it is so it doesn't need to be perfect. Allow them to form those images and have them be works in progress um, and not be afraid of what they'll look like if they're quote unquote not perfect in that way. The goals of second grade, um, which are to be comfortable, to help the students feel comfortable and to love being there. And that's really about it, really. There are academic goals, which we'll get to in this video. But to me, they are secondary. I know it's school and all, but they are secondary to laying that foundation of reverence, veneration, and love for the teacher and love for each other. That if, Think about it. These kids are going to be together. If they're together for eight years, that's a long time. And then they go to high school for another four years. And then they go to college for another four years. They're in school. They're, their heinies are on chairs for a long time. And... They really need to love learning. So I want to lay that foundation work in first and second grade. That said, um, I touched a little bit in the first video about wisdom figures, saint legends, and fables. So I won't get too much more into that in this video, other than to say that you can use those things to teach arithmetic uh, as well as language arts. Um, I had given the lowercase letters uh, last year in first grade um, towards the end of the year, and so we just picked up right from there. Um, we did a lot of individual reading as well as group reading. I had a very precocious class, um, so we really just sort of jumped right in there with, with all of the academic work. And I still kept it light, homeopathic doses, really. Um, and uh, not to overfeed those little intellects because that, that life force, that forming force, is newly freed with the change of teeth. After it's working on the body and stuff, 
you know, it's now freed at around age seven. So we're working with that eight, seven, eight years old. That's a young etheric force. So I give them little doses, homeopathic doses. Although we did do some rote memorization work for the times tables. I put the times tables to songs. One times two is two, two times two is four, that kind of thing. We did that. We did rhythm stick work with the times tables. Um, and one thing I want to say here um, is that um, over the years I have learned to toss out circle in the morning. Um, I really believe it has no place um, in the early morning hours of a Waldorf first, second, third, any grade, really. Um, brain research has showed that the best time for learning intellectual academic type work is the morning. And uh, I used to have these elaborate half hour, 45 minute long circles. And then they're exhausted. Oh, rosy cheek, that's great. They're, you know, I, I, it's wonderful, I suppose, in a certain sense. But then again, for the, the energy I'm expending to get them to do the circle is tremendous. And their energy to hold that space. And then I'm going to ask them to sit down, listen to a story, and do some written work. Now, one can say they're physically ready now because they're active. They've just been physically active. However, all of that singing and recitation, um, it's too feeling life. It's too astral. It scatters them. And so it's too much energy for you and them. So five minutes. One good song that you can develop and work on. One good poem that you can develop and work on. Maybe one or two movement things, and then get on with it. Be done. I should also add that in my second grade, um, age 15 is when our school starts officially. And I allow these kids, some of them have walked to school, some of them have ridden their bikes. I have one who rides a unicycle, really. And um, I have others who drive long distances. And so, at 8.15, they come in, and I let them do string games. And I let them do beeswax for an hour draw. Talk. Chill out. For 10, 15 minutes. <sighs> Foundations of Human Experience. Read that book. Steiner talks about helping the, the main goals for us. We told those first teachers are to help children learn to breathe and sleep. So to me, one of the ways I do that is helping them feel comfortable and at ease. If they can breathe easily in my classroom, then good. They'll eventually sleep well, right, if they're not anxious. So they come in, they chill out a little bit, and then we start. I don't make a big production anymore about attendance, um, and I certainly don't move the desks around and have a giant circle. Um, have them sing and move later in the day. Um, but the morning is really for getting some uh, academic learning done. So, uh, I would also, um, at some point during the year, I can't remember when I did it, it might have been at the beginning, but I started to put form drawings on the board when they came in. Things like, uh, I may have put uh, that there. Uh, for example, uh, with or without a little story as they walked in the door and I shook their hands. And I would say, all right, you finish that in your form drawing book. Um, I would give them form drawings in the morning to do. I would sometimes give them simple arithmetic problems, addition and subtraction. Towards the end of the year, I gave them word problems, somewhat elaborate word problems with several steps. Um, we started to work on mental math right away and continued that through the year with uh, number stories. Um, Steiner talks at some point about um, it's really wonderful for them to form these images of numbers and shapes in their, in their minds. And you can do that a lot with mental math. So I would encourage that. That's a wonderful thing to do in lieu of uh, circle nonsense. So mental math. Um, I wouldn't even do a lot of recorder work in the morning. It just gets them too out there. Um, do it later. Do it later um, in the day. 
So, form drawings, I, I did on a daily basis. I didn't have a block of form drawing anymore. Um, we still, you know, did them on each other's backs, and every now and then I took the sand out, and they'd do it in sand, and do it in the air, and all that. That's all important stuff. Um, but I didn't guide them as strictly as I did in first grade. Um, it would be on the board when they came in, and they would go from there. Sometimes it was a finished form. Sometimes it was one that I said, you need to finish. And later in the year, I would have students come up with uh, their own forms. I didn't tell them to, they just would. And they asked, can we do this form? And so I would. I would put their form on the board. <laughs> and uh, why not? Why not? Oh, it's developing too much ego. No, it isn't. It's something they're forming from within themselves. And I want them to feel a healthy sense of pride and accomplishment. So. Form drawing. Um, I wanted my students to be uh, reading, even though I know that shuts off a certain connection with the spiritual world. Once that, uh, especially because so much of the literature is so fantasy driven. But we also are teaching how to read. We're we're school in the modern age, and uh, so we have certain concessions to make, and so we're teaching them to read far younger, I think, than they really ought. But there it is. Do it as gently as you can, as lovingly as you can. Right? So, so you leave space in their hearts to grow into the art of reading for pleasure, information, and just joy. Um, and arithmetic. Um, we did, of course, place value was like this next big thing. And uh, we did it with piles of rocks. We did it with acorn caps that we collected. We did it with pebbles. We did it with little gemstones. Um, I wanted them using their fingers and hands a lot. And so what that meant was there wasn't a... Every day we weren't writing and drawing in our morning lesson book. I know that may sound heretical. But I, I, I don't know if I mentioned it in this video, but I, I, or the, the last one about teaching second grade. But to me, the morning lesson books can be, become too much of a crutch for teachers. Um, you know, I, I, I guess you need the, the breath, right, to have them just be doing something like that. So that I understand. But they can also form these concepts with their hands, with their bodies, and later, right? So if, if, if you have a day where they don't put anything down in the morning lesson book because they've played place value games with rocks and stones and things, okay, right? If they've done, done a drama about the, the wisdom figure lesson you've told. And they didn't get a whole lot done in their book. Okay. It's okay with me. Um, part of language arts, as I'm learning them to read through writing and spell through writing, I would actually say to them, uh, as the year went on, sometimes I'd give them something to copy. Like if I, if I get a little piece of St. Francis or something, a little legend of St. Francis, a little piece of that story. I might give them a couple things to write and copy right in their book, so they have an example of beautiful language, proper, all that kind of thing. But another day, I may give them just one sentence. Another day, I may give them one sentence and then say, you make up the next sentence. I may give them the summary of a, of a fable, a real short summary of a fable, and leave off the ending and say, you write the ending. Oh my goodness, but creative writing shouldn't happen until 7th grade. Which wonder and surprise. Let them write creatively in 2nd grade. It's fine. Really, it's fine. Sometimes I even said, make up your own ending. I even had them write their own fables. I even went so far as to imagine themselves as a wisdom figure, as a quote-unquote saint. What healing powers would you bring? What things will you overcome? And I had them write about that. Um, why not? If we're helping form good habits and conscience and the memory and these forces of veneration and reverence, beauty and authority, we, we want them to form these pictures within themselves, not just me giving them the pictures all the time. I don't think that's very helpful. 
guide them, give them examples. But Steiner says they must form these pictures within themselves. So I let them express that through writing. And then I would have them come to my desk, uh, which I called the spelling hospital, and I would literally, with them, with me, standing next to them, we would edit and do things in a very gentle, loving, humorous way, guiding them through that process. So that may be what they got done in terms of the written sit-down work. And other children were making a border, other children were maybe uh, sculpting something out of beeswax while that's going on. And, uh, and that is a successful morning lesson in terms of the written work. Um, I may have a couple of students come up, if we're drawing a picture, I may have them form a little tableau image that we can copy. Instead of just me drawing an example, I'll say, all right, so you hold that for a second. Everyone got it? Yeah, that's it. So a little tableau scene of a story, um, let them act that out and, and then hold it. Uh, be models as we draw. And they like doing that. It's a lot of fun. Um, also, second grade. Um, what else? I feel like I'm missing something. So we got uh, form drawing. Mostly symmetrical things, uh, horizontal as well as vertical. I did some four corner um, symmetry also. Um, and also, I continued on with the vowels, expanding that, word families. Um, I got in a little bit to the parts of speech. That's the other thing. Gently because I really want to do that in third, a lot more in third. But in second, I can give a little hint of that with um, what I call painting words, where the adjectives, doing words, uh, the verbs, and naming words, the nouns. Just a little bit. Just a little bit, because I want them to learn to construct a sentence. I do. And so we would do that. The lion roared. Perfect sentence. Okay, how can we make it more interesting and more imaginative and more vivid? Ah, the golden lion roared loudly, that kind of thing. I didn't say adverb or anything, I just, it's still a picture, it's still a painting word, it describes something. Kept it light. Um, periods, capitals at the beginning of sentences. I did all that with light touches, homeopathic touches. I also, however, had students that really wanted workbooks. I had students in second grade that wanted homework, and I gave it to them, little bits, little bits here and there. I had students who just loved and wanted 30 edition problems. I gave it to them, little bits here and there. Um, I gave worksheets out to those that really wanted them. And uh, so we did, in my class, we eventually got to borrowing in a very gentle way. We got to carrying in a gentle way. The times tables, we tried hard to hit all those again through rote memorization, through flashcards, through song. And as far as the academics, you know, that's really about it. <laughs> um, again, you're laying the foundations for future work. And the foundation being loving learning, loving you, loving being at school. Um, one of the things I like to do um, before I taught a story like uh, Jerome and the Lion is in second grade I would say, um, raise your hand if you know something about lions. Oh my gosh, the hand shoot up. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a lion. And you know, it just gets them involved with what's about to happen. So this story takes place in Italy. Anyone ever been to Italy? Anyone know anything about Italy? Give them that moment to share themselves, to invest themselves, to give me something, to give each other something that enriches and helps them feel confident and happy that they've contributed something. And it's not just me always giving them something. <laughs> Sorry. So. I, I, do, I do that. Um, as part of my review of the story, uh, I do want 
that etheric memory to be worked upon the formative memory. So I want them to know things in chronological order, and that's important. But I also may do a review of, oh my goodness, what was the scariest part of that story? What was the saddest part of that story? What was the funniest part of that story? What do you think so-and-so learned? What do you think, what could have happened that didn't? And I'll say right here that I changed my uh, wisdom figure, Saint Legends, I changed my fables to suit the people before me, my class. That may sound heretical, but these were all oral stories told and passed down. You can have a million different versions of Saint Francis and a million different versions of the, the, the tortoise and the hare. So I changed them as I see fit. I did that with fairy tales too. I want them to be accurate, of course, for the archetypes and the spiritual lessons. That I haven't changed. But I may add things in to address a pedagogical issue in my class. Um, and I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to make up your own stories as well. So, um, yeah, uh, prior knowledge is good. Also, the way you speak, the tone of your voice, how you speak is crucial. We imagine this newly born life force, etheric force, born at around age seven, changed teeth. It's young, it's a baby, it's uh, one years old or so, one and a half, first, second grade. It's a, it's a newly born force. So treat it with great gentleness and reverence. So speak gently. I rarely, rarely raised my voice in second grade. And I don't think I ever did in the first grade. how I speak, who I am as a human being, inwardly transforming and working on my own stuff, crucial to what's going on in that classroom. Children are eager. They bring their own gifts and their own lessons that they want, their destinies from the spiritual world. I really need to treat that whole thing with reverence and beauty and gentleness. So, one of the things Steiner says is, uh, children should be storing within their memories treasures of thoughts and images that they can work on again uh, once the astral is born later. So I want to give them memories of happiness and joy. And um, what else? Uh, I feel like there's something else. Oh yeah, I wanted to read this to you from uh, Education of the Child on page 57 of this edition. Children have an extraordinarily sound instinct for what is good for them. As long as only the physical body has become free to interact with the external world, and as long as they are in the process of development. So this is in the context of their bodies forming, and the etheric being freed to work, work on for memory and intellect and all that. Children will indicate what is beneficial to them. However, if from early on this instinct is disregarded, it will disappear. Education should be based on happiness, on joy, and a child's natural cravings. It started the thunder here in Philadelphia. So, I say that and I bring that to you because we focus so much of our energy on giving them things, bringing things to the children. And of course, it's what we're supposed to do, right? However, more importantly, we're supposed to learn from them and take from them so we know what to do. That means observing them, listening, watching, and trusting. There's a reason they're doing what they're doing. Even if it looks naughty for lack of a better word. So trust them. Let them show you what you are to bring in the next day's lesson or in the next block. And if I don't trust them, they'll sense that. And they won't trust themselves. And Steiner says it'll disappear. The instinct, it's an instinct for them to show me what they want me to teach them. Uh, on the page before, on page 56, 
It makes a difference whether the child is surrounded by pain or sorrow or happiness and joy. Happiness and joy build sound organs and lay the foundations for future health. Everything around them uh, must be beautiful and giving joy. So, that said, uh, here's a few songs and poems uh, that you could use for Alright, um, one of the songs I learned somewhere in a teacher training somewhere, so I'm sorry if I don't ascribe these to the proper sources. Uh, one of them is uh, goes like this. This is the way I learned it and sang it, uh, probably too astrally, but you can make it however you want. Um, this was a song we worked on for a lot of the year. They love this song. I put the fastenings on my boat for a year and for a Sun, which I think is boring. Um, but anyway, I didn't do the King of Ireland Sun this year. Um, but use it if you want. But that song's with that um, story. And anyway, you can do it without it, as I just said I did. Um, little speech work. Flowers, fruits, and feathers rare. Flocks and fields and fountains fair. Give those to them. Mumble and mutter are meddlesome men. Making mistakes again and again. Another one they liked that I gave them was, I never felt felt that felt like that felt felt. I also gave them this one. I thought a thought, but the thought I thought I thought was not the thought I thought I thought. If the thought I thought I thought had been the thought I thought I thought, I would not have thought so much. Now, you don't have to worry, by the way. I'm going to put the lyrics in the and the words to all these in the About section of this video. So if you look down, you'll see the title of the video and how many views and all that. And below that, there's a little thing that says About. If you click that, I'm going to put all of the uh, uh, words to these songs and poems there. And again, please don't make a giant 45-minute circle out of all this stuff. Five minutes in the morning. Use these throughout the year. Okay. Uh, Walter de la Mare poem, wonderful one. Slowly, silently, now the moon walks the night in her silver tune. This way and that she peers and sees silver fruit upon silver trees. One by one the casements catch her beams beneath the silvery thatch. Crouched in his kennel like a log, with paws of silver sleeps the dog. From their shadowy coat the white birds peep, doves in their silver feathered sleep. A harvest mouse goes scampering by with silver claws and silver eye. And moveless fish in the waters gleam by silver reeds in a silver stream. It's a lot you can do with that poem. 
Uh, clap your hands every time you hear an S sound. Ring a little bell. That kind of thing. You can work on that. Um, uh, another song. Make my living in Sandy Land. Make my living in Sandy Land. Make my living in Sandy Land. Ladies, fare thee well. I raise big taters in Sandy Land. I raise big taters in Sandy Land. I raise big taters in Sandy Land. If you can't dig them, I can. Hop, come along, my pretty little miss. Hop, come along, my pretty little miss. Hop, come along, my pretty little miss. We won't be home till Sunday. You can do movements with that, dance around with that if you want to. Another Walter De La Mare. Poor, tired Tim. It's sad for him. He lags the long, bright morning through, ever so tired of nothing to do. He moans and he motes the live long day, nothing to think about, nothing to say. Up to bed with his candle he creeps, too tired to yawn. Too tired to sleep. Poor, tired Tim. It's sad for him. Uh, one of the things um, I did at the beginning of the day before we did our morning verse was uh, Awake, no, 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 I got it wrong. Awake, awake, the step to take and make our way to the light of day. And you can't see this, but I'm going to do the same with my legs. Awake, awake, the step to take, and make our way to the light of day. And I might speed it up. Awake, awake, the step to take, and make our way to the light of day. Awake, awake, the step to take, and make our way to the light of day. And then we do the morning verse. Um, let's see. The end of morning lesson, I did one, wisdom shines through me, love glows within me, strength flows through me that I may arise, true to myself and true to you, a server of holy things in all I do. Um, end of the day verse that we did uh, went like this, I stand tall upon the earth, my hands reach out to the world. I stand tall upon the earth. The world reaches out to me. And filled with light, my heart and mind reach up to the stars. Above my head, a rainbow blooms. I stand tall upon the earth, and to the world I go. Let's see, uh, what else? Um, oh, another poem found somewhere. Rumbling in the chimneys, rattling at the doors, round the roofs and round the road, the rude wind roars, raging through the darkness, raving through the trees, racing off the wings of the rooks to the sea. Uh, a little round that I learned um, uh, at a teacher training, and I can't remember the person's name I learned this from, I'm so sorry. But... If I remember, I'll put it in the credits. But it's uh, a, a little round you can do with them. And the first part, slow and steady, carefully ready, tortoise takes his time. Nice and easy, if you pleasey, life is so sublime. And the second part is for the rabbit. Quickly, quickly, oh so quickly, is the clever hare. This way, that way, going the fast way, rush from here to there. So you can weave those together, and uh, if you want to. Uh, let's see, what else did I do? Oh, yes. Um, so we had uh, African Heritage Month, a month, a Black History Month, whatever you call it. Um, and so I did a whole block of... Um, African wisdom figures. And so, I know these songs are a bit on the astrally side and that kind of thing, but uh, little touches of the culture I think are good. 
So one of the ones I did was by a gentleman named Samite, and uh, the song is called Tokido, and it's another good one to eventually work into an early round. Um, and it goes, Tokido, Katuna do, Katuana wano, Katuna do, Tokido, Katuna do, Katuana wano, Katuna do, Hadi bumpa bumpa bumpa, ti bum ti ba be. Hadi bumpa bumpa bumpa, ti bum ba ba. Hadi bumpa bumpa bumpa, ti bum ti ba be. So some, the children can do, or I can do the, they can do the to, he do, katuna do, katuana wano, katuna do, and then I can come in with tari bum pa bum pa bum pa ti bum ti ba be. And uh, there's a third part that goes a be ti bum ti bum ba ba. So, there's one you can do. Um, another song we did, I, I, I was looking up things about uh, St. Josephine of Akita, and I found this wonderful African school, this wonderful group of children singing this song. I changed the words a little bit, but it's basically, uh, Welcome, dear brother, son. Welcome, dear sister, moon. We are happy to see you today. Come down and live in our hearts. Uh, that's another little one. Let's see. Oh, winter time. Velvet shoes, adapted by me, written by Eleanor Wiley. Let us walk in the snow in a soundless space, with footsteps slow under veils of lace. Shod in silk and woven wool, white as cow's milk and wings of a gull. We shall walk through town in a silent peace, stepping on the down and silver fleece. In velvet boots we walk in the snow, with fire in our hearts wherever we go. Um, we did a little round thing, not round, but sort of parts with that. I had some kids doing this crunch, 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 crunch of the sound of crunching through the snow, and other kids were doing the shush, shush with the wind. Um, wonderful poem by Harry Bain, or Ben, B-E-H-N, it's called Waiting. Dreaming of honeycombs to share with, a small, with her small cubs, a mother bear, sleeps in a snug and snowy lair. Bees in their drowsy drifted hive sip hoarded honey to survive until the flowers come alive. Sleeping beneath the deep snow, seeds of honeyed flowers know when it's time to wake and grow. Uh, let's see. Higgledy, piggledy, pop! The dog has eaten the mop. The cat's in a flurry, the pig's in a hurry. Higgledy, piggledy, pop! See, I'm just going to give you a few because, you know, I want you to make up your own. Uh, so there's this famous poem, This is the Key to the Kingdom, and I changed it around. And it goes, the version I did was um, this. This is the key to the kingdom, in that kingdom by the sea. In that kingdom there is a city, in that city there is a town. In that town there is a street, and on that street there winds a lane. On that lane there is a yard. And in that yard there is a house, in that house there is a room, and in that room I hold a basket of never-fading flowers. This is the key to the kingdom, in that kingdom by the sea, to share the beauty and gifts I have. The key to the kingdom is me. I am the key to the kingdom. So, there's one. Um, Let's see. Uh, spring is showery, flowery, bowery. Summer is hoppy, croppy, and poppy. Autumn is slippy, drippy, and nippy. And winter is breezy, sneezy, and freezy. I also, by the way, would write riddles on the board um, and uh, have them try to solve them also. I feel like I'm forgetting some things, but um, uh, 
Uh, attention getters um, I used in my class, I would say, Mamma Mia! And they're supposed to repeat, What a spicy meatball! Totally zany and silly, but they loved it. Um, I could say, Give me five! And they would do five deep breaths. That kind of thing. And I just realized I counted down, but you'd really count, <laughs> count up. Ah. Um, so, uh, let's see. I did a, a song, uh, a version of Canticle of the Creatures, Praise Be the Lord for Brother's Son. Um, look on my YouTube channel and find it. Um, it's a long song. I don't want to do it here. But it's my own version of uh, the St. Francis thing. Welcome, or uh, good morning, brother, sunshine. No, what is it again? Oh, um, praise be the Lord for Brother's Son. Praise be the Lord for Sister Moon. Yeah. So that version is on my YouTube channel. You'll, you'll find that if you look around a bit. I have a Shruti Box version and a live version and me many years ago when my hair was short singing it with my guitar. Um, so, I think that's it for second grade. Just to give you some ideas of songs and poems, things like that. Wow, that's loud thunder. I don't know if you can hear that on the video, but it's really booming now here in Philadelphia. I hope you found this little video series uh, helpful. If you need anything or have any suggestions for me or want any... Uh, other thoughts or ideas, uh, feel free to go to tappingwithmusic.com, uh, my website, and drop me a line. I do uh, concerts in and around Philadelphia as well as something called EFT, but I also do educational consulting, Waldorf inspired style. So, thanks for watching. This is Joseph Anthony uh, saying take care for now. Have a great school year.